I'm going to call this, uh, use this as a sort of a prayer laboratory uh, this afternoon. And I'm going to try to reveal some of the secrets that I have used. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and I'll be, some of them may be a little startling, a little different, a little unusual. And some of you may have heard some of the things that I have uh, discussed in different prayer groups. I'll never forget a gathering we had, a, uh, a camp in uh, Oklahoma some years ago, when in a prayer group I asked if anyone had a special, difficult problem. I said, we'll work with the most difficult thing first, and then all the rest will seem easy. My mother used to say the reason why they always served cheese with pie, the stomach had to work so hard to digest the cheese that it digested the pie. Well, one woman spoke right up, and she said she had a problem that was a mighty big one. She said, I have a hundred gallstones on one side and the growth on the other and terrible headaches. And I said, that's enough. I just wanted one thing, and I didn't want a, a hundred. Uh, Jesus met his problems of his day with uh, parables by taking a parallel situation and uh, having just come back from Palestine, where they still live as they did in those primitive days, I have found that he used a parable for every walk of life. You can't name a single person, a, uh, a builder, or a, even a general, or a woman who lost a coin, or a shepherd, sheep herder, or a, country, a, a farmer, or a fisherman. Every one of them, he gave them something they could take hold of with a definite handle of their own experience. If Jesus were walking this earth today, he would make marvelous uses of the radio. I might begin and end right with a radio. He certainly would make prayer a very real thing, a very convincing thing. Uh, he would use the uh, jet plane, uh, the vacuum cleaner, the pressure cooker. Uh, he, he would use the electric light bulbs, uh, press a... Uh, press the switch and all the lights in the house goes on, whereas in his day all they had were uh, oil lamps they had to work over and take good care of. Well, I thought of the vacuum cleaner in a case like this, and my mind went back to the days when they had vacuum cleaner wagons, and they'd send one out to your house, you'd pay them $25, and they'd then send a half a dozen men into the house with long hose-like things. And in a few hours, they would have the house clean from top to bottom and save the housewife three uh, weeks of hard work. So I said, let's just ask the Lord to send his celestial vacuum cleaner wagon down and let his angels go in and draw out from you all the poisons, infections, and toxins. That's all I could think of that might be in a, in a body. I didn't know how to get after gallstones or growths or anything in a mechanical or a, phys a physician manner. Well, I knew if he could remove the poison and the causes, we might get somewhere. Then I went a step further, and I said, let a, another set of angels go in your subconscious and draw out all the frustrations and fears and resentments. Let them go down the corridors of, of time, way into the past, to your childhood, and draw out the uh, open doors there of that uh, fright you had as a baby and that hidden frustration of your childhood that you never told anyone things that cause uh, uh, allergies and all sorts of things that you can't quite find the roots of. Let them just keep it up for the next three weeks. They never, these angels don't slumber in their sleep. Let them keep it up day and night for the next three weeks, the next three months if necessary. And then I uh, ended with a prayer, and she said, I don't feel any different. The next morning she said, um, she sent word that she was in great pain and couldn't come to the meeting. Could we come over and pray for her? So and Brown and Louise Eggleston and Mrs. Miller and I went over and the three of them sat on one side of the bed and put their hands on her. Now that made six hands and I thought that was about enough. So but I just put one hand on I thought seven would be enough. I put the other hand in the hand of the Lord and I said, Lord, thank you for keeping those angels on the job, but they're working too fast. It causes pain. It reminded me of a, of a Scotch minister I had read about who had prayed for rain. And it sprinkled, and he prayed harder, and it rained harder, and he prayed still harder, and a cloudburst came, and he looked up and said, Lord, dinner be ridiculous. <laughs> well, I didn't tell that story, but I felt like it, and I said, Lord, just uh, slow them up, but don't let them stop. 
And uh, let your healing love come in now and touch up all the sore places and uh, fill all the vacant places. And uh, after a while, she said the pain had gone. Now she, we went out, and uh, we hardly got outside before Roland Brown said, I drew that pain up into my arms. Louise Eggleston said, I never had that experience before, but I did too, so we had to stop and pray the pain out of their arms. Now this is a laboratory, and I'm going to just tell you some of the inner workings as I've discovered them. I have found that if you press down too hard and are too eager, sometimes when you pray for someone who's ill, you take on the symptoms. Or if you're a little bit egotistical or ambitious to have your batting average uh, high and all that. But if you can just be so released, you just let it go straight to the hands of God. Don't get your personality into it at all. It's perfectly safe. After Roland Brown had had wonderful power in healing, he stopped it because he said, I find I'm taking on the symptoms. Then he became so selfless about it that he's gone right ahead and they've written, Robert Star Daly wrote a great book about him. Uh, I'm mentioning these things, so you don't need to be discouraged or disturbed that uh, if you do take them on, you know that you've taken hold of it. Here's a room, and the other room, there are your neighbors in that room, and his, you all have your door open on the garden of God. But his door is jammed. He can't reach God, so he leans on you. And he sweeps his dust into your room. Then you open your door, and you sweep it out. And sometimes, if you don't sweep it out fast enough, you uh, find the symptoms right there. So I have found that it's one of the best ways to help folks is to really be, have sympathy for them. Uh, even almost suffer with them. Uh, even be a little scared, if necessary. Now, the Christian scientists are afraid of fear. I don't mind a little fear, a little concern. If you quickly give it to the Lord, that's just simply a sign that you've got hold of the thing. Two days afterwards, we got a, uh, I got a telegram, a long distance telephone call from this lady in Texas. Four days after this uh, camp ended, I got a long distance telephone call. She said, I just came from the doctor. He took an x-ray and he wouldn't believe it, so he took three more. All the gallstones are gone, the growth has disappeared, and my headaches are a whole lot better. Now, I'll be very frank in saying these things don't happen every day. Uh, if we go back and study and find exactly how the conditions were met, and when they're met 100% all the way around, you can find uh, and expect marvelous things. But if you know how difficult it is to get that 100%, uh, often the person doesn't have the faith. Jesus never said, my, my prayer has healed you. He said, your faith has made you whole. And sometimes the person may have the faith, but they have a deep grudge against somebody that blocks. Or they may have a fear. Something happened here that all I can say is that it can, does work. Therefore, we are come here as a laboratory, and I'm going to ask right now, how many of you here uh, would like to be sent to the cleaners this afternoon? Put your hands up. <laughs> all right, we'll just take uh, three minutes off and, uh, and uh, start the vacuum cleaner to work. Just close your eyes, bow your head and bow your hearts. Now, our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for sending us Jesus. We thank Jesus, we thank you for talking to us in language that we could understand. That you came down on the ground floor with us and used the illustrations and the parables that helped. And without a parable spake ye not unto them. Now, we know that we hardly need to resort to this parable if we could just accept your promise. Jesus, that come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll simply draw out your f frustrations and your fears and your entanglements and, your, uh, and the poisons of your resentments. Uh, for I meek and lonely of heart. So we're going to ask you, Jesus, to supervise this little job and let your healing angels come in and draw out from us all the poisons and infections and toxins hidden away there beneath uh, some, little, uh, uh, some little sack or tonsil or somewhere is an infection from still remaining there from the flu that we had three years ago. We have all kinds of little things hidden away. We're all of us carriers of TB germs, they say, which makes us, we just carry enough of them to make us uh, immune to the real thing. But we're not going to ask you to let your healing angels just work there for a day and night, for a week or two, until they can clear out our bodies. But let us, another set go into our subconscious and go down the corridors of time and open those hidden doors of our childhood and pull out all 
those frustrations and fears and resentments packed away, hidden away through our middle life. Let them keep it up for months if necessary, but don't let them work too fast. Uh, but let your healing love flow right in and just fill all the vacant places. Fill us with thy love. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, ever, and ever. Amen. Uh, I've given this definition of love as the power that brings everything into perfectly adjusted and harmonious relationship with everything else. Uh, Ralph Budd uh, used to come down, I was by the way my father handled the company that he was president of. Every company my father went into, they doubled their business within a year after he took charge, and his secret is very simple. He invited in the agents from all over the state, and he said, now we want to be one big happy family, and he put love into it. He got them all to love him and love each other, and the result is everything moved in perfectly adjusted, harmonious relationship, and the business came in. Ralph Budd took him as a motto, put that into the Great Northern Railroad. He used to have me come down and show me the methods he used. And uh, the Time Magazine made the statement recently, that half the railroad presidents of America got their training from Ralph Budd. Uh, love. If you don't do anything but love for a solid week, you'll find every cell in your body will commence to fall into perfectly adjusted and harmonious relationship with every other cell. Uh, when we came to St. Paul 40 years ago, a woman was dying of cancer in the next block. Uh, her husband was uh, a chief engineer of the Milwaukee Railroad. They had money enough to send her to all the best hospitals and all the greatest specialists. And they all said, in six months, you'll be gone. She went to an old lady who believed in prayer, and the old lady said, there must be somebody you hate. She said, there certainly is. I can't even think of her without feeling sick all over. Well, you'll have to forgive her. There'll be no hope. I'll never forgive her. That night, her husband asked her what the verdict was, and she told him. He said nothing, but when they were ready for bed, he said, let us kneel down beside the bed and have a prayer. He put his arm around her waist and said, Now, we're not going to get up from this, our knees until you have forgiven that woman. Then we'll kneel here all night. But before morning, she gave up and forgave the woman. That was in 1912, 42 years ago. A couple of years ago, I was in Miami in a great church, and on the front row sat that lady, looking just about as young as she had 40 years before, perfectly sound and well, and people come to her now for prayer. Uh, love is the power. God is love. You don't need to go much beyond that. But uh, that vacuum cleaner thing can often help to clear the way. And now, uh, three nights from th now, when you happen to fall asleep, you might say, Lord, uh, thank you for uh, being on the job. Just keep those va vacuum cleaner angels in the job. Another question comes up. When you pray and uh, have faith, do you have to pray again? I have found it's very necessary to pray again, if your subconscious is not on the job, if you don't believe the thing clear through and through, if you're merely, if it's merely lip accept, acceptance, that's why we have to pray so often. Jesus held up importunity in prayer in two, in two parables. One of them was uh, about a, a hard-boiled judge, an unjust judge. One was a lazy householder. Now, you can, you can talk to me for a solid year, and you can't persuade me that God is either a hard-boiled judge or a lazy householder. But you don't have to talk to me one minute to persuade me that my subconscious is very unresponsive at times. It's laziest, doesn't want to get up from its evening na nap, and it's uh, holding on to old traditions that, uh, that you never can cure cancer. It, it's going to sleep on that. doesn't want to get up and go through the energy. It's then you can pray for that. It's just too lazy. Or it's simply hard-boiled and cynical. And so you have to do a lot of praying or affirming or something to make your subconscious come into a line. Folks have asked me to tell them about uh, how to make your feet hind's feet. <coughs> well, the, the rear feet of the hind, the female deer, always tracks perfectly with the front feet. And when they go up a dangerous cliff, they, all they have to do is to see that their front foot is on a safe place because the, uh, the uh, rear feet unconsciously comes up and, uh, up to the, exactly the same point where the front foot was. But you look at the uh, horses raised in the, in the cities, and you'll find they've lost that gift, and uh, it's not safe for them. They'd go falling over the cliff. How can you get your subconscious so... Uh, in a tune with your conscious mind that everything you believe will be believed clear through. A little child can. 
little child actually believes it uh, when they're uh, given a promise. And I have found, uh, when I get some little children to pray with me, that the power is simply tremendous. Uh, now, how can you do that? Well, a little child doesn't have to keep hammering away. Uh, a woman had a headache, and she called in her friend. And she was so ill with her headache, she had to go to bed. Her friend prayed, but that didn't work. When little Johnny, her eight-year-old son, came home from school, she remarked, little Johnny has more faith in prayer than anyone in the family. If that's the case, said the friend, I'm going to call him in. Well, he was playing in the backyard with a bunch of boys, and she called him in, and he came in with his dirty hands, his cap on with a ball bat in his hand, and the mother said, I wish you'd pray for my headache, Johnny. Okay, and on he went running down the stairs and, and yelling in the backyard, it's my bat, it's my bat. And she said, that was nice of Johnny. He usually stops and gives the sweetest little prayer. Wasn't that just too bad? But even while she talked, the headache went away. And her friend said, I think Johnny had something to do with it. So at supper time, she asked Johnny what he'd, if he'd prayed. Sure. Well, how did you pray? I went out on the porch and I said, God, Mom's got an awful headache. I should worry. It's my bat. <laughs> he gave it like that, all given. He didn't have to stop and say, I... Lord, just you must do it. I want to believe perhaps you can. I'm going to, yes, you've been good in other things and argue and everything else. He just stepped in. So I found to get my subconscious into the game, when I learned how to pray 30 years ago, I went through a little personal training that some of you might like to know because there were lots of folks said, how did you get started? How did you get, to get this power in prayer? Well, I took the Psalms and I'd read them, memorized some of them, and I'd say them out loud. Now, I'm a great believer in the contemporary life. Those psalms were written for folks in that day, although they're universal. So I wrote some psalm prayers of my own, contemporary, that, that would meet my need. I would sometimes read one of these, sometimes one of these of mine. And I would hold it in my hands, uh, get the sense of touch. I would see it with a sense of sight. I would say it out loud to the sense of taste, and I'd hear it to the sense of hearing. If I had some incense, I could just smell it. I would just say a phrase like this that I had written myself. Uh, Heavenly Father, we know that your love is infinite. If your love is infinite, it must fill all space, otherwise it would be finite. If your love fills all space, it must be occupying the very space I'm occupying here and now. I couldn't escape it if I would, and wouldn't if I could. Therefore, uh, nobody had hurt love. And no, no a bulldog would bite love. Nobody could injure love. Therefore, I'm impervious as in a citadel. When I start walking down the street, I don't need to have any fear. If I can just release myself of that absolute faith uh, that I'm just abiding in your love, and then when I speak, I speak love. When I think, I think love. When I act, I act love. For we know you would always do your work by means of love made manifest in man. Then I'd read it over again out loud. And the third time, and I just charged with it. Positively, I think I could have gone in a lion's den, and I'd have been safe until the charge ran down. Around noon, I'd have to recharge myself. I actually used that sort of a method, and I found that it was a remarkable thing. Uh, even the, uh, the, now the New Thought people use a lot of that, uh, 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 affirmations. The, uh, the Hindus use mantras, and uh, the uh, Catholics will uh, I'll say things over and over again. There's an Episcopal clergyman at our prayer group yesterday, and I asked what would be uh, the thing that you touch. I asked them if it would give you strength. And he said, um, uh, Lord, have mercy upon me, something like that. And uh, he said, I'll repeat that about uh, ten times, and then I, it, uh, then it, I, I get filled with it. Uh, some people, uh, a businessman in um, uh, Houston, um, Mr. Tom Phillipson, who uh, built all the churches and most of the hospital, hotels and things. He has 25 architects working under him, an uneducated man, but he's a CFO and his wife. If some of you know that wonderful Mrs. Phillipson. Uh, she used to pray that he would get this. And now, she said, he's far, far more than she does. They get up in the morning at 5 o'clock or 6, and from 6 to 7, they just read spiritual books. I said, how do you pray? He said, I just read spiritual books in the Bible. Though I get so full of God, I just don't need to pray. But if I'm not full enough of God, then I have to pray. It's a, re a charging yourself. 
Your subconscious, it, it, just steeped in it, clear through where you just know. Step right out without any fear. Uh, George White, a uh, missionary's son, brother of uh, Mrs. Uh, Agnes Sanford, was in a, a pasture surveying a field, and a bull, a wild bull, came charging down upon him, and he uh, saw there's no escape, and he simply turned and mustered all his faith in God and his love, just let love go out to the bull, and he said, see here, uh, you're God's bull and I'm God's man. You don't have anything against me, I don't have anything against you, and you're not going to have any fight. And the bull stopped, absolutely stopped. It was a bull that would have destroyed anyone else. And then when he came out the next day, it came trotting over, and it would follow him around and eat grass right around wherever he went, uh, like uh, Ferdinand, I guess. But at any rate, when Helen Keller went in, charged through and through with faith and trust into a lion's den, why, the keeper didn't want her to do it. He had to have his gun, but she went in with all so charged with it, uh, hold like a little child. She could just uh, feel the teeth of the t uh, lion, it just purred. Even fell went off the end of the tail. It's got a little fuller brush at the end of the tail, she said. Now, uh, you have a... Uh, there's such a thing as charging you, getting charged with this, and you don't really need them to pray. Jesus didn't pray when people came that were sick. He went out in the, uh, the night before and got just charged with it. Uh, his subconscious. He said if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, that is clear through. You take that mustard seed and cut it in half and I have the subconscious half over there that doesn't agree, it won't uh, grow anything. The whole thing, when your whole mind and then he, all he had to do was let him put the in his garment. And uh, you, people simply get well. If the cap's farthest out in this atmosphere of love, they get charged in it without any prayers often. So I, that's where you work. That's the next another thing. You get down that subconscious. Then uh, about this matter uh, about continuing your prayer. I, uh, I use the uh, methods to get my subconscious awake. And then if I can get the faith, I let go. And if the problem is how to let go. I used to pass an open Bible around the prayer group, go around, and I would say, now, uh, lay your burdens on those promises, but don't lay them there if you're going to take them up again. Uh, there was a woman who had been ill for two years and was going to be operated on the next day, and they, she had them take her down to this prayer laboratory in the afternoon. And as she put her hand on that Bible, as she left her ailment, she took her hand away and simply left it there, and a strange feeling went through her body, and when she... And when they examined her the next day for the operation, they decided, well, he said, they said, we better take an x-ray. Something's happened. And the whole thing had been absorbed uh, almost overnight. Uh, it, it's when you really do let go, completely let go, like that little boy did uh, when he gave it to uh, the, the father. And that is a, uh, any means you can use to get folks to let go. Now, we have a prayer tower in St. Paul. 1571 Grand Avenue, and if you find something you can't let go of, it's all right to mail it to someone that can. Um, no physician treats his own family because a physician's courtesy requires the other man to do the work for nothing. So let him do the dirty work. The one reason is it's, uh, they discovered that the father will be worrying about that boy, and his worry and holding on will, ho will check the healing, whereas the neighbor doctor says, take those pills twice a day, little boy, and he goes out and helps to bring a baby into the birth at the next door, and he forgets all about Johnny. He just drops Johnny into the hands of nature, or in the hands of God, where they go beyond nature. They all, every great physician, one great physician told me, have faith. They said, we do most of our healing by faith. We know the medicine just prepares the way. Nature does it. All the great ones have faith in nature, and the greatest ones, he said, go through, through to, to the or origin and have faith in God behind the nature. And so uh, when Agnes Sanford uh, uh, told me that she found it so hard to let go of her own daughter, she could let go of her sons, and I could let go of my daughter, but I found so hard to let go of my son, because he'd make the same mistakes I was making in college. Now, <clears throat> one of the hardest things parents have to learn is to give their children the privilege of learning by their own mistakes. The Iowa mother, the uh, one year, I was speaking at the college where she uh, was the wife of the president. She had four fine children. I said, what is your secret? Why do you deserve to be called the Iowa mother? She said, I, uh, 
Give them lots of love and lots of wholesome neglect. Give them lots of love and lots of wholesome neglect. The same way with your prayers. Put a lot of prayer and faith in it, and then after you let go, then just neglect it. Go away and leave it in the hands of God, and don't fuss about it anymore. If you can do that, and if you can't, get your neighbor. So I said to my to Agnes, well, then suppose we trade. You pray for my, you worry about my son, I worry about your daughter. And they both improved. Ten years later, they met and fell in love and got married. And after the wedding, Agnes said, I didn't know we were trading him for keeps. <laughs> I found one of the best ways, and as I'm talking this over the, uh, into a loudspeaker so it can be sent to little towns where they're trying to start prayer groups, I'm going to tell you another thing that has helped tremendously in prayer groups. Uh, down in Texas uh, one year, at the first camp I was out, I said... When I was a boy, I used to put eggs under our, uh, our hens and would trust those hens. And I'd mark the date 21 days away, and sure enough, here'd be 12 little fuzzy chickens. And I have discovered that I have more faith in those old hens. I had more faith in those old hens than I have in the Bible, in the promise in the Bible. So I've been using the Bible now uh, a little more powerfully than I use those hens. I'm going to suggest when you go home, you take a sheet of paper and draw 13, 12 or 13 eggs, and write 13 prayers on them, and put them in the 91st Psalm. Bert said, he will cover thee with his feathers, and under thy wings, his wings thou shalt trust. <clears throat> and mark the date 21 days away, <clears throat> and when the time is up, open it up <clears throat> and see what's happened. If you have faith enough, if you've let go enough, you may find some wonderful things. <clears throat> it's very wonderful, write the prayer tower. Now, I was gone for three months of camp, and I didn't get back to St. Paul, and I forgot to tell the prayer tower. And when I reached home in September, all the prayer tower people gathered around me, and they said, what are you doing? Are you going into the chicken business? We're getting the strangest letters all summer. Here's one that just came this morning. Three weeks ago, I put in a setting. Today, I found that seven had hatched. I know why three didn't, because I carried them around, and they got chilled. I worried about them, and I didn't leave them under the wings. I'm quite sure one of them was a rotten egg because I had some resentment in it. Now, you just try this. Uh, <clears throat> at the Ohio camp a couple of years ago, the leader said to me, look out for a certain woman from Norfolk, from that Durham, North Carolina. She'll get, if she gets you in a corner, she'll just talk your head off and you can't escape. Most of it will be about her husband. So one day she got me in a corner. <clears throat> And she talked the straight uh, street for 10 minutes until finally I found myself looking out the window. Uh, she's telling about her, uh, her husband being an alcoholic and all that. And I found myself looking out the window to see if there's a saloon handy that I could slip into. <laughs> finally, I said, uh, see here, lady, you quit talking and start doing something. I think I'd be an alcoholic if I was your husband myself. And she said, what will I do? I said, you take a sheet of paper and write, draw 13 eggs on it and put her names, uh, put the 13 prayers and put the, be sure to put your husband's name on one of them. She came to Tennessee camp and she's a new woman. She went quit drinking, my sister quit drinking and oh, she just went into rhapsodies. And when I was in Durham, speaking in there in the uh, visiting uh, J.B. Ryan and addressing the, uh, the, uh, Theological Seminary there in, uh, at, the du at Duke University, I found that this lady, her first name is Hazel, was the spiritual spark plug of the city. This prayer group springing up that she was doing, she turned all that energy into plant putting these things in the promises in the Bible and seeing them hatch, and then she just threw herself out in love and helping folks, and it just transformed. So if that's the way that you can help, it'll help you let go, use it. Now, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, uh, what shall I say, um, uh, uh, superstition in this thing. It's no uh, rabbit's foot or anything. It simply means to help you let go. And if you can let go as simply as a little child, you wouldn't need to use these. But I commend this to you. I really commend that you use the, uh, the Bible and you put those eggs in there. And then after the, uh, the three weeks are up, you might like to put them in the 13th chapter of Luke after they've hatched, because, and that Jesus who said, uh, Come, oh, how I would have gathered you under my uh, wings as a mother of what is little ones, and you would not. 
I suppose you just put it on Jesus' wings and let him kind of brood over them for a few months if you want to. Now, if any of those things will help you, let go. Use them. And if you have a better method, you tell me. And we'll just... Uh, I, I find this helps folks more in prayer than anything, is teaching them how to let go. Uh, there is a... The next step in prayer I have found is to... Uh, is a total and complete surrender. Uh, not 45%, or, or 95 even, but 100%. That little difference between 99% and, uh, you may say, uh, well, how, what do you mean? Well, I, I don't know if there'd be a big difference. If you take a, a limb that's taken off of a tree and put it up within a fifth of an inch of the tree, it isn't going to rock them. And if, you, if my arm is cut off and they can sew it back on, uh, and if everything's just right, quick. I've known those things to happen, but you don't put it uh, a half an inch away. And the point, point is, it's either the whole thing, or you might say a miss is as good as a mile. Uh, we, we've got too much, uh, just 99% in our churches. And I mean, our church members. Uh, uh, old Topher was given a drink of uh, near beer during prohibition. They said, here's some near beer. We want to get your opinion of it. And he took a drink, and the old toper said, whoever called that near beer was a poor judge of distance. And so he has, I, so I, some folks say that our religion, we just inoculated enough with religion, so the real thing won't take. And um, you may find the folks that will be scoff at you more than anybody else, and it makes the atheists themselves, will be good church members who think that this is a crackpot idea of really going the whole way. And so I have, uh, I have often, when people are really, come to me that are in tremendous need, are ready for a great, uh, great leadership, I do a strange thing, what I used to do to myself. I tell them to kneel down and give themselves into complete captivity, 100%, to Jesus. And uh, not 99% or 98%. Uh, Jesus himself put it that way when he said, uh, he that be first among you shall be as a servant, and he that be greatest of all shall be as a slave. Now, a slave is like a branch on the vine. You can't, it can't free itself, can't get fired. Uh, a, a hireling, you can fire or it can resign. But a slave just moves, right? It's just like a branch on the vine, and when the vine moves, the, 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 vine, the, the, uh, the branch moves. Paul's power was that I am a slave of Christ, and everything that, every thought that he came through him practically was Christ's thought. He was so attached to him, so one, bound. Jesus put it in a different way when he said, um, in his time of prayer, I mentioned five times the word oneness in, one, in just a few sentences. Uh, well, thank you, Lord, that uh, I pray that they shall be one with me as I'm one with you, and we'll all be one and one. And then he gave that wonderful illustration that I'm the vine and you the branches. And evidently he must have called them slaves during his time because at the very end he said, no, now that I'm stepping into heaven, no longer do I call you slaves, but but friends, because now you're to step out and you're to be slaves of, of God the Father and the Holy Spirit only. Well, at any rate, uh, <clears throat> uh, just the process of being willing to be humble. Uh, Fifty years ago, there came into Oklahoma City a man with a span of mules. Fifty years later, he died, uh, leaving $50 million, enough to wreck any family. One of his sons would go down to the business and work uh, until 3 o'clock, and then he'd be so bored with life, he'd go home and go to bed. He uh, got terrible um, headaches. He took to drink, became an alcoholic. The AA finally pulled him out of that. He had a private yacht and a private airplane, everything money could buy, but he's just bored with life. <clears throat> then someone told him, why don't you go to a camp farther south, and what's that? And he came, and he... Uh, 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 met a, an old lady, and she said, Peace be unto you. And he said, I guess these must be crackpots. Then he said he saw a bald-headed man charging up there, and he got up and talked for a little while, and he said, If this is the kind of eloquence I've come for, I have gone to the wrong place. And so he went up to that bald-headed man and asked if he could have an appointment, and this bald-headed man said, Are you going to be here for some time? And I said, Yes. Well, you wait for uh, two or three days, till you've heard me talk a few times, and then I'll have a prayer with you. And he said... Uh, afterwards, he just considered that a brush off. He knew I was never going to see him. But finally, a certain day came. I said, now, come into my cabin, you and your wife, and let's have a little prayer. And I surprised them by having them kneel down. And I gave them just utterly to Jesus, just completely. And he went walking down the hill. She went to her cabin. 
and he didn't feel any different, but all of a sudden, he, his feet felt so light, like he walked on air. And all his headaches left, and they never came back again. Two or three years have gone by, they never come back. He had a disc in his spine that was uh, causing such pain that he bought 37 different mattresses, the finest kind of mattresses. He didn't sleep on all of them at the same time, but he, uh, he took two or three of them, and when the camp was over, he rem all of a sudden remembered He'd been sleeping on an old YMCA mattress that sagged like that, and his back trouble was all gone. And then even his airplane came flying up to Arkansas camp. And then he came flying up to Kansas City just to see me. Uh, uh, well, he said, I said, what brought you here? He said, I just came up here to tell you some good news. When I went back to Oklahoma City, I realized that I hadn't spoken to my brother-in-law for two years. Broken off all relations, business relations, I hadn't spoken to him or to my sister. And I said, now that isn't right. Now that I found Jesus, I ought to do that. I should, that isn't right. So Saturday night, he called up his sister, and she said, come out tomorrow, 11 o'clock, and let's have a little visit. And he said to himself, if my brother-in-law isn't there, I'll tell her what's happened. But if he's there, I certainly won't. And he was there. Where have you been this summer? Oh, I've been up at Oklahoma, uh, up, uh, at a lake. And I spent some time up in the mountains of Arkansas. Well, what did you do there? Oh, I just fooled around and had a good time. After a while, his sister looked him straight in the eye and said, We know where you went. You might just as well tell us. Well, I learned how to pray. And I've got a prayer group in my fam home, and I wish you'd join it. And she said, Well, couldn't we have a prayer group, a family prayer group? I have some friends, some relatives, some folks I'd like to have us pray for right now. And so there was a man who didn't even know there was a God two months before telling them how to pray. And finally it came 3.30, 4 o'clock, and they discovered they'd forgotten all about their Sunday dinner. Why? And he said, now, any time you want to...